Good afternoon. Then. I will start now talking about relativizations of formulae or terms to other terms. So this is actually section 1.4 in the notes, if you would like to turn to that. So let me just give here on the board some idea of what, what we're trying to do with this. So I'm thinking that we have our cone of sets here. So this is V here. <clears throat> and I think of a term. Again, I'm thinking, I'm dropping the word class here. Sometimes I say it, sometimes I don't. A class term, W say. Well, we saw it was a syntactic string. Set of Z such that phi Z holds. And I tend to synonymously use the word term for the syntactic string, but also the collection of sets that this definition picks out inside our universe of sets here. So I can think of W as being a collection of sets that satisfy phi here in this case. So I'll often talk about this as if it's sort of like a mini universe, right? It's a chunk of sets. And we can ask, what properties does this chunk have? Maybe it satisfies some of the axioms of set theory. Right? This will be when it's most interesting to us here. Uh, but there are certain sort of uh, pitfalls as well. Uh, it might be that W thinks something is true about one of its sets here. But that doesn't mean that that is actually true in the universe V about that set. So there's no a priori reason why truth about objects should be, we shall say, absolute between W and V. W may only have a very restricted view of the universe. So to give a concrete example, maybe W is, maybe it even contains all the ordinals. Maybe it's quite a big thing here. Maybe, it's, maybe it defines we get a proper class W here. And indeed, the universe of constructible sets, Girdles L, that we shall build, will look something like this. It'll be a subclass of V containing all the ordinals. So here are the ordinals going up the middle here. So of course, the, uh, they start out 0, 1, 2, N, and so on here. And here's omega. Right? Now, what may happen is that <coughs> uh, W may see this ordinal here and it will think this is the least uncountable ordinal. What it'll mean is that W's got no function from omega onto here. So I'll write this as omega one in the sense of W. So, So this is the least ordinal. That is not countable. In the sense of W. So this is kind of perhaps a little bit vague down here. But what it would mean is that the ordinals in between, these are countable, there are functions in W from omega onto something in between. If alpha is less than omega one of W, it's countable 
in W. So there's going to be some function here from omega onto this alpha with F in W. So there's a function that witnesses the countability of the ordinal alpha inside W because F is there in W. So W has got a whole bunch of functions from whose domain are omega perhaps. And we look at those functions which are onto ordinals, right? And omega one of W is precisely that least ordinal for which there is no such function in W. But there's nothing in this picture that says that W has got all of the functions with domain omega into the ordinals. Right? There may be other functions that are outside between W and V, and let's call it F bar. And this function in V, we say collapses omega one of W. is onto omega one of W. And here F bar, so this is in V, but it's not in W. Right. So what one would say is the truth of the statement, W thinks this ordinal is the first uncountable ordinal, that statement is more well, true in W, but it's not true in V, right? V does not think this is the least uncountable ordinal. Because of F bar, the real omega one, or V if you like, is something larger. So we say the concept of being omega one, the least uncountable cardinal, is not an absolute one between classes of sets such as W and V. Of course, the picture could be slightly different. It might be that W had all of the functions whose domain is omega right, in it, in which case the omega one of W would be the same as the true omega one. Right? There's nothing in this picture that, that requires that. So what we're going to do is think about how the truth value of various statements could vary between V and the collection of sets given by a term W. So this is the kind of theme for today. Right? Um, I don't know if you want to send in, uh, send or uh, even just give me some, uh, speak up and just give some uh, questions at any point. Um, I think there's a few of us that I think I said before, I think you could turn video on and turn your microphones on and it's not going to collapse the, the system if you if you want to do that. Uh, so this idea of, I mean here, here you can see this creeping in, omega one of w, right? So this is the first uncountable cardinal in the sense of w, computed in w if you like. Or we look at the definition of omega one, the least uncountable ordinal. And I think of that definition as interpreted in this W here. And we'd like to know how to make this formal, correct, watertight definition of this idea of interpretation. And then we want to investigate and see which concepts are absolute between W and V. Can we say anything about that? So this is this is the task for task for today.
Right, so uh, let's see, let me, uh, we may go back to the board, but let me share the screen at the moment to look at definition, uh, not numbered actually, at top of page 11. Right? So let's see what's there. <clears throat> what we're looking at here is what you see in front of you is a way of classifying formulae of our language. This is known as the Levi hierarchy. Right? And if you're used to a logic course, you'll know that in a first order language, there are atomic formulae. And these are kind of the basic building blocks of the logical language. So what you'll see down here, let's look at one down here. Here are the atomic formulae of our language. They consist of equations and epsilon statements. So variable VI is a member of VJ, or VI equals VJ. So these are the atomic formulae. And the classification is by number. So actually, uh, I mean, historically, these are called the delta zero formulae. Right? These are the simplest possible formulae. These are the atomic ones, right? And various other things will count as delta zero as well. So the next clause says, if phi is delta zero, then not phi is. And so is the disjunction of two, two delta zeros. Okay, so, so far we've just got these equations and epsilon statements. So it's saying that V not equal to Vj is delta zero. And Vi not a member of Vj is also delta zero. Now the third clause, it says, if I've got a delta zero formula, I can put what's called bounded quantifier in front of it. So an unbounded quantifier, it would just look like there exists vi phi. The boundedness here is saying, I'll constrain where vi can range over. vi can only range over the set, which is going to be put where vj is. So VI is bounded by VJ here. Now you might say, oh, this isn't part of our formal language and you'd be quite right. But we can, as always, express this in our formally simple language, go up to where we see bounded quantifiers. And here we see exists VI and VJ is actually an abbreviation for this at the right-hand end of the sentence statement line. It's actually, it exists a VI, so it's a VI is a member of VJ and Psi. So logically this has the same effect as this bounding of VI by the set VJ. So we say exists a VI a member of VJ, this is a bounded quantifier. And there's a for all version as well. For all VI and VJ, Psi happens. I can abbreviate that in our official language as for all VI, if it's in VJ, then Psi holds of it. Um, the next line here is a mistake. This we allow terms for VJ. So you should correct this by crossing all of this line out. I mean, from allow, we allow up to etc. This is wrong. Right? We don't allow terms for VJ or the only terms we allow are variables. So please cross out this bit here. It's incorrect. So the delta zero formulae are the ones we can build up from atomics using not an or and these bounded quantifiers. <laughs> and 
going back to the screen again. Sorry, going back to the whiteboard again. So if I take a bounded quant bounded statement like this, so let, let me think of putting in some. There is an x in y such that <coughs> x is different from z. Suppose I want to verify this formula, the truth or falsity of this formula. <clears throat> right. I only have to look inside y, and I just check. I look in y, and I look at the x's that are inside y, right? and I'll just check that there is something there that's different from z. And if so, tick, right? the formula is, is true. Right? Or if I've got something like for all x in y, something like <laughs> x equals u. So this is only going to be true if y equals this. Right? But to verify the truth of this formula, I just have to inspect the members of y right, to see whether this, in this case, simple atomic statement is true, or in this case, a negated atomic. I mean, you can contrast that with some other statement that's like without a bounded quantifier. If I say for all x psi, x holds. <laughs> this statement is about the whole universe of sets. So we say this is about, we say this is a universal quantifier. Right? Well, this formula is universally quantified because this quantifies over the whole universe. Of sets. This is an existentially quantified formula. Right? So no bounds on these quantifiers like here. So this says there exists something. So to verify this, we have to search through the universe of sets and find an x that possibly makes this psi work. So we say this is a universal statement, and this is an existential statement. And if I find an X that makes this work, I can say it's a witness to this existential quantifier. There's an existential witness to this, this quantifier here. <laughs> So there's a fundamental difference here. Here I just have to find one, here I have to verify everything. So these are more complicated than these bounded quantifiers, where here I only need to verify, I only have to look inside the bounds. So I've got some y here, and I can verify the truth of this by just looking inside y. There's no set that I can look in a priori and verify this because the X I need may be outside the Y. <clears throat> so such formulae like this, if this is a simple delta zero, of the ones we've described, this is classified as sigma one. Don't ask me why, right? Again, it's, this is just history. And this one here is classified as pi one. So, yes, universal are pi one, existential are sigma one there. And note that a universal statement is in fact, this is some delta zero thing, a universal statement is just a negated existential, right? Because this holds, Right. This is equivalent to saying, this is equivalent to saying it's not the case that there exists an X such that not Psi. I mean, if this is Delta zero, by the second clause in the definition of Delta zero, this is also Delta zero, putting a negation in front of Delta zero, still Delta zero. So this universal becomes the same as a negated existential. 
And if we now go back to our cone picture, Here's our V. Here perhaps is our W. If I take a delta zero formula, X equals Y, or X is a member of Y. <coughs> Maybe X and Y are here in W. Here's X, here's Y. <clears throat> what would it mean for W to think that X equals Y and for that statement to be true in V? Well, two sets are equal if they're the same members. That's basic, right? So, if x equals y, then we're going to have that x equals y in the sense of w. Because there's nothing in x that's not in y and vice versa. So w is going to think the same. But the reverse is questionable. <clears throat> Suppose this little world thinks that x equals y. That's because in W, it doesn't have any set Z in W, which is in x, but not y. So this implication is not necessarily the case, right? It might not be just as with the collapsing function of the omega one, we might not have a, a, an element Z which witnesses the difference between X and Y. It may be that X is different from Y and there is some Z out here, which perhaps X does not equal Y, but any Z which is in this symmetric difference so this is sometimes written by mathematicians like this, x delta y, but it means the things that are in x but not y, or the things that are in y but not x. So things that differentiate y and x. It might be that all the z's that show us that x is different from y, these are all in v but not in w. <laughs> So from W's perspective, X looks like Y, but that's because it's missing these Z's, right? So a remedy for this situation, if one thinks of it as a defect, is to say, <clears throat> okay, let's think of W's instead, which this kind of arrangement, this kind of thing can't happen. If X is in W, X is a subset of W. So then all the elements of X are in there and all the elements of Y are in there. So if X is truly different from Y, W will see that it's truly different from Y. And what is that property? That's just saying that W is transitive. Right? Any element is a subset. So we remedy the situation. By requiring that W is transitive. All right, so again, recall what that means. That just says for any X, um, if X is in W, then X is a sub set of W. Right. 
So we're often going to think of transitive collections of sets, right? Transitive terms, W, because then we won't have to worry about these atomic statements between sets, their truth value. That's the same inside V as in, in W itself. So that's, that's the first thing to note is that by transitivity, right, we ensure that W is correct about whether sets are equal or not. Thus, the axiom of extensionality will hold in transitive and any transitive class of sets. doesn't, it's not saying the axiom of the extensionality implies if it's true in a class W, the class is transitive, right? This is a, um, a sufficient but not necessary condition. So you'll often see me uh, say, let's take a transitive class W, let's take a transitive term W. And the reason will be precisely this right here. So, so if W is transitive, then W will be, will be correct, right? about delta zero expressible properties of its sets. And it may look like a little bit complicated or convoluted way of saying something, but we're gonna come back to this and talk about this, this idea um, uh, later. I'll say that the expression we use, I'll just introduce it now, we'll say that um, <coughs> delta zero expressions are absolute. That's what's being defined here for transitive W. So I abbreviate W's transitive by this here. <clears throat> okay, pause for any questions if you want to come through. Okay, let's continue then. Um, let's go back again and let's take a W. That's here. So let be a transitive class of sets here. So again, just to emphasize when I say class, it doesn't mean it's a proper class. It might be that W is a set. On the other hand, it could be. So by this, W is going to be correct about, a, about epsilon statements. This is one way of phrasing it. If, it's, if W is transitive, it knows all the epsilon facts about its elements. Because if x is in w, then x is a subset of w. So I take any element of w, 
W knows all about the epsilon statements about elements of X, right? Because they're all in there. So it's obviously correct in inverted commas about epsilon statements. You just have to look inside X to see whether some set A is in X or A is not in X. Let me draw this slightly differently. Let's go to big, back up to this other, similar to this other example. Here in the ordinals, here's this omega one of W. <coughs> Again, so let's, here's omega one of V. Here's the true omega one. So what do we have? <clears throat> we have that in V, there is some function which takes omega onto this ordinal. So V sees that this is countable. So V thinks there is some function f, its domain is omega, and f is onto omega one of w. Well, this ordinal, let me call it alpha. It's an existential statement. It's saying there is f such that something or other. And all this you can actually write down in a delta zero way. Right? Again, we'll do things like this later. I just want to get over the idea at the moment of um, this idea of something being true in one universe, but not in another subuniverse. So here's f. So this f exists outside of uh, my w. So this existential statement is true in V, but it does not, there's no witness for that there inside W. F perhaps is not in, is in V, but not W. So being countable, it may something may be countable in V but not countable in W. So we say it's not absolute downwards. On the other hand, right, if I say here's the true omega one of V, so what holds in V? It says for all F. If the domain of F is omega and F is a map from omega into omega one of V, then F is not onto it can't be onto because then the cardinality of this ordinal would be omega. And it's not, it's at least uncountable, ordinal. This is a universal statement. It's a for all. So for all F here, this is tr true in V because this is omega one, the true omega one here. Yeah. There can't be functions hiding away in here, right, in W, which are from omega onto this ordinal, right, because that F prime is also something in V. And we know there are no such things in V. So this universally quantified statement, which is true in V, 
is not, can't be falsified by going to W, to the smaller universe. On the other hand, the existential statement, right, which was uh, true in V, is not necessarily true in W. Because the existential witness may not lie inside W, it sits outside here. But if this is a statement about for everything, it's true about all the things that are in W as well as a subset. So logically, if a universal statement holds here, then it's going to hold in a smaller subclass. So we say somehow something like universal statements are downwards absolutes down to smaller universes and existential statements are upwards absolute from smaller universes to bigger ones. So let's say sigma one statements. are upwards absolute this will, we will come back to this i1 statements are downwards absolute and sort of just motivating what we're going to be doing with our relativizations But shorn of all this kind of nomenclature fluff, the sigma one pi one, the ideas themselves are relatively simple. It's just where the things that witness the quantifiers sit in relation to the, the, the W that you're talking about here. Yeah. So let me go back to the, let's go back to sharing the screen. Page 12, definition 119. So now what we're going to do is make this mathematically precise. <laughs> So the definition of the four clauses there <clears throat> is we're going to give a, re a recursive definition of what it means to take a formula of our language phi and so-called relativize it to w. So I think of a way of syntactically interpreting the form phi inside the class of sets given by a term here. And the long and the short of it is Basically, you take the formula and everywhere you see an existential quantifier exists X, then you bound the quantifier by the term W. Remember, our four official formulae only have existential quantifiers, negations, disjunctions and atomics. So let's see the relativization of an atomic, either a membership or an equation is just itself. The relativization of a negated statement is just the negation of the re relativized statement. <clears throat> and I can relativize a disjunction of two things by just looking at a disjunction of the two already relativized subformulae. So this is kind of straightforward and the actual <clears throat> power of the definition, such as it is, is this last clause, 4. I relativize exists x psi by saying there has to be an x in w such that psi holds relativized to w. <clears throat> and the idea is that, of course, w may be given by some expression itself. W is maybe the collection of Zs such that 
5z holes. So it's just a thing to keep it syntactically clean is to make sure that I don't use the same variable x outside here, which occurs as one of the free variables in the formula that defines w. So we just want, we don't want unintended binding of variables by quantifiers. So we just insist that we only define this when x is not one of the free variables in the formula defined in w. Yeah. So that's a syntactic definition here. And here is something that I alluded to on the board. Right? If W is a transitive class, then the axiom of extensionality holds in W. Now, I was sort of indicating this semantically by saying, let's consider sets and consider what's, what's in or out of a, a transitive class W. <clears throat> but now let's just look at the syntactic recursive definition we've just given. And we'll just see how, we just check that it kind of works, so to speak. Here is the axiom of extensionality, which I've given, written out, and I've, I'm going to relativize it to W, and I just apply the defining clauses that were just at the top of the page. What does it mean? It means a quantifier is always replaced by a bounded quantifier. So exists X becomes exists X in W for all X. Again, not exists not. Replace is becomes for all x in W. So the statement here for all x for y is now going to start out for all x in W for all y in W. And then I relativize what comes after those two quantifiers. And that's what I've expressed here. So now I work on this bit that's in here. Here's another quantify, quantifier for all z that's going to get replaced by for all z in W. And now I have to relativize this bit. And arrow is the same as not P or Q. So actually this will also just be arrow with this bit relativized. This is atomic, so it relativizes to itself. This is a combination of atomics and negated atomics when you write out the equivalences logically. So this relativizes to itself. So what I've done is found an equivalent expression on this last line to the axiom of extensionality relativized on this first line. That's just syntactic manipulation according to the definition above. Now I use the fact that W has been supposed to be transitive. If W is transitive, any members are subsets. And then this is, as I said before. So if there was some difference between X and Y, there'd be some Z here, either in X, but not Y or Y, but not X. But if I'm assuming X and Y are subsets of W, this Z will be in W, if there is any. Hence, I can say there is a Z in W, which illustrates that difference right here. So that justifies the crucial left to right direction here of this last equivalence. Right? W is correct about these statements. If they hold in W, they hold in V. So this is true. Right? And then this is true which is what we're after here. What the next definition does is say, we relativized formulae. So let's just see how we relativize terms. And of course, a term is defined by a formula. So we relativize the term T to W by the following device. We just restrict the X's which make up T to come from W and X had better satisfy the formula, defining formula phi relativized to W as above. So 
Here are some examples then. V in the sense of W. <clears throat> v we define to be the collection of all sets X which equal themselves. That's how we introduce this letter, this term W, uh, term V, right? So let's see what V relativized to W according to this algorithm is. The algorithm says here, I restrict X to W and I'll relativize the defining formula to W. But atomics relativize to themselves. So this then becomes just X, this one here just becomes X equals X. So what have we got? We've just got the X's that are in W. So V in the sense of W are just those sets that are in W. Okay, so this is W. So the universe in the sense of W is W. You might like to check, for example, that the empty set when defined in W is the true empty set, if W is transitive. Here's a less trivial example. Let's compute the big union of X in the sense of W. Here I've got the definition of the big union of X. It's the collection of Z's for which there is an intermediate Y, such that Z is in Y is in X. I relativize this to W. I just apply that algorithm. I restrict the sets in my term to W. I relativize the defining formula. So when I relativize the defining formula, I restrict quantifier to W, there exists a Y in W, and I relativize this, which is just a conjunction of atomics. So it becomes just that. Okay, this was done without prejudice as to whether W is uh, transitive or not. But if now W is transitive, right, then X in W implies X is a subset of W. Yeah. Also, it, because every X is a subset of W, any element of X is a subset of W. So you can see it coming now. If I look at the collection of Z's in W for which there is a Y in W, such that Z is in Y is in X. This is the same in W as in V, if W is transitive, because W contains all the elements of X. And for every element of X, W contains all the elements of that Y. So in that case, when W is transitive, but only if W is transitive, perhaps, big union of X computed in W is just the big union of X. So again, this is something that's absolute for transitive classes. And we could prove a lemma here, which I'll just finish on by stating or letting us look at it, but I'm not going to. Um, it would be rather uninformative and rather, rather tedious. Uh, proof by induction on uh, complexity of the syntax of the terms and the formulae involved. But let's just look at the idea. The idea of the lemma just says, if I've got some terms and I've got W defining for me a class of sets and W is transitive and I've got some formula in our official language, then let's collect together the free variables of this formula here phi where I've stuck in the terms for the free variables x0 to xn here. Yeah. So this says, basically we've got a sort of commuting operation. I can put the syntactic terms into the syntactic phi and relativize it to w. Or I could do something else. I could relativize each of the syntactic terms to w and substitute those into the relativized formula. 
And the equivalence here says this order of operations doesn't matter. Whether I put in the terms into the formula and relativize, it's the same as first relativizing, putting them in and then relativizing the formula. So this will be an induction on the complexity of, of phi here, but um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to take up time in doing that here. Okay, so the time is up. Um, you might like to read on and look at at least the statements here of 124 um, and a little bit of 125 here. I wouldn't, uh, myself, I wouldn't prove all of these. I mean, I shall not prove all of these in, in, in class. I would just say a little bit about them next time. Uh, okay, so, okay, that's, that's that for now. Then um, do please come to the problems class tomorrow, uh, especially I'm gonna concentrate on things that are perhaps prerequisites of the course that one or two of you might not have. So bring questions along about that. I mean, I think the problems class works, you know, I think online like this, I mean, I think you're just going to have to ask questions, right? I'm not going to be able to look at your faces and see what's puzzling and what's not puzzling. Um, it's entirely for you, these sessions here. I'm not going to be lecturing during the problems classes. Uh, I'm going to try and help you understand, you know, the concepts that we've done so far. So I think the time is best used by you asking me concepts that you found difficult. I can explain those and then when we have time, I can go, try and give more examples of things to make things clearer. But I have to know from you what it is that needs to be made clearer, <laughs> right? So please let me know either either in email or during the during the problems class itself. <laughs>